Hi everyone! Okay, so the final part of Dr. Lyer's talk contains something absolutely astonishing. An argument I hadn't heard before. And what's even more astonishing is that I thought it was a pretty interesting one. Oh, oh, <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's stupid, but there's some interesting physics involved. So, let's have a look. What about distant starlight? I want to spend some time on this one, because it, this, this seems to be a big problem for a lot of people in terms of embracing what the Bible teaches. It really shouldn't be. I'll let him explain. Distant starlight really is not a problem for young universe. What I'm talking about here is these, the, the fact that we can see these galaxies that are billions of light years away. And when I use the term light year, that is a unit of distance, not time. A, a light year is about six trillion miles. Okay, and so when I say the universe is billions of light years in size, that just means it's really big. Get on with it. And so you'd think if these galaxies are billions of light years away, that it would take light, you know, billions of years to get from there to here. And obviously the light has got from there to here because we see them. And so doesn't that prove the universe is billions of years old? Well, yes. And this has come to be called the distant starlight problem. But I, and I want to give you what I think is a solution to this. Let me guess. God did it. There's actually a number of different ways to resolve it, which is interesting. And of course, God has access to solutions that, that we might not have even thought of or even considered. He's not bound by laws of nature as we are. But I do want to point out that some of the proposed solutions really don't work. And I, and I mention this because sometimes people will come up and say, well, have you thought of this? And yeah, we've thought of that. And there's a reason it doesn't work. Some of the simpler solutions that um, people think of really have been investigated and they don't pan out. The idea that the distances aren't real, maybe the galaxies are all within 6,000 light years, it's not realistic. Even our own galaxy isn't within that distance. The idea of the speed of light was much faster in the past. I think that was very worthy of consideration. I'm glad that they looked into that, but I think there's compelling evidence that it was not faster in the past. The speed of light is linked in to other properties in nature. I'll remember you said that. Uh, light was created in transit is one that I want to spend a little more time uh, showing you why I don't believe that's a good idea for starlight. And, and the reason is because it would require God to create fictional images. Here we have supernova 1987a. There was a star in one of the Magellanic clouds, and that little star right there in 1987 decided to blow itself to bits. If you, if you believe in light and transit, this didn't happen. It was just a picture that God made in a beam of light, and that really bothers me. It's not that I don't think that God has the power to do that. Of course he has the power to do that. The question is, is it consistent with his nature to do something like that? And I don't think it is. But couldn't that just be... And I think God did that just out of um, his creative diversity. No, that would be stupid. I'm going to suggest that the solution may involve... I'm going to give you what I think the answer is. I think it involves the one-way speed of light. And that is the speed of light on a one-way trip, as opposed to bouncing out off a mirror, a two-way trip. The speed of light in vacuum is 186,282 miles per second. Very fast. But that is a round trip average speed. Um, okay, so you want to throw out the second postulate of special relativity, which is used to derive the rest of the theory. Okay, you can do that. It's just a postulate. It's just that if you do that, you'll end up having to rewrite a bunch of very well-established equations just to make sure that you end up making predictions that match experimental results. Making all you're doing, all these changes, empirically superfluous? I mean, there is going to be no way to distinguish your version of special relativity from Einstein's version experimentally. So you're adding complexity without increasing explanatory power. Excuse me. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Lyle, it's for you. It's a Mr. Occam, something about a razor. And it'll reflect back, and as soon as I see the reflection, I'm going to look at the clock and see how much time has elapsed. And so it's traveled a distance of 186,282 miles twice, and it's taken two seconds to do that. So the average speed is 186,282 miles per second. That's how you get the speed of light. Well, there are plenty of other ways to measure the speed of light. You can measure it without having to rely on measuring the flight time. But yeah, I think I see where you're going with this. It could just be that the nature of space is such that light propagates at a different speed this way than it does that way. 
actually know when you're about to explain why. So, so I'm hoping that this will be the case, but hoping for something doesn't make it so. We want to see if we can do an experiment to measure the one-way speed of light. I'll spare you Lyle's long explanation. I can think of a lot of ways to do this, and so can Lyle and you too, probably. But they all fail because they rely on the assumption that the speed of light is the same in both directions, as postulated by Einstein. Yes, even that method. And that one. And that Stop. The real problem is that it turns out that you can rewrite special relativity so that the one-way speed of light is relative. And the predictions of this rewritten version, as I already mentioned, will match the experimental results, as long as the average speed of light on a round trip is c. Physicists have checked this out not because they think the one-way speed is anything other than c for all inertial observers, but to see if what they accept can be confirmed experimentally. Since all such versions of the theory that maintain internal consistency make identical predictions, this appears to be impossible. What they accept is not a truth about the physical world, but a useful convention justified by its simplicity compared to any alternative. But with that said, remember that thing about C being tied to other things? The speed of light is linked into other properties in nature. Light is an electromagnetic wave. How it propagates through vacuum depends on how electromagnetic fields behave in vacuum. This is described by Maxwell's equations, and from these we can derive the speed of light. Not the one-way or two-way speed of light, but the speed of light, period. It's a scalar constant that depends on two other scalar constants, mu naught and epsilon naught, the magnetic and electric constants. Not much room for it to vary, is there? This is the main justification behind Einstein's postulate. We know the speed of light from both Maxwell's theory and empirical measurement, and since it's a scalar constant that gets its value from other independently measurable scalar constants, there is no reason to even suspect that the one-way speed is any different than the round-trip speed. If it were different, Maxwell's equations would have to be rewritten in a way that takes the direction to the observer into account. Now, you could do that, I'm sure, but in order to match all experimental results, any complexity you add has to cancel out anyway the second a testable prediction is made, thus making the whole thing pretty pointless. Yeah? That's for you again. That light requires the same time to traverse the path A to M as for the path B to M is in reality neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. We choose the one-way speed of light, and that tells us how to synchronize clocks. And that quote is by Albert Einstein. Einstein recognized that the one-way speed of light is not something you measure, it's something you choose. Yeah, I just said that. You know, you're not helping your case. In fact, you just shot yourself in the foot. Which means I can choose it to be something very different than what most people do. In fact, I can choose the speed of light to be infinite when it's dire directly toward me and half C when it's moving away. And the reason I pick those two values, it, it has to average to C. It has to average to the speed of light that's the round trip speed. Yes, you can do that, but as you acknowledged, you're not making a statement about the true nature of light, you're just making an arbitrary choice. You can't resolve the distant starlight problem this way, because it doesn't just arise from some arbitrary choice. It arises from the fact that all relevant empirical observations are more parsimoniously explained by models that employ Einstein's convention. We can't test a convention, but we can test how well models that make use of it fit with other models. As Lyle has acknowledged, blue stars die quickly. Blue stars cannot last very long. Red stars last longer and therefore accumulate over multiple generations of stars. Heavy elements also accumulate over stellar generations as they are produced in stars. In other words, we can conclude that when we analyze the light from a young galaxy using a spectroscope, we should expect to see the indicators of a high proportion of blue stars and low metallicity. Note how none of that depends on any assumption about the one-way speed of light. Now, if we look back in time as we look out into space, we should expect to find that distant galaxies look young as we are seeing them as they looked in the distant past when they in fact were young. And guess what? Distant galaxies look young. 
So Lyle is actually advocating adding unnecessary complexity in order to get less explanatory and predictive power. And I'm not done. We live in the middle of a bubble of space-time that we call our observable universe. As space expands, something that Lyle accepts, by the way, Expansion of the universe. The Bible describes God as stretching out the heavens like a curtain, spreading them out as a tent to dwell in. The more distant an object is from the observer, the faster it will recede. This results in more distant galaxies being more redshifted. That is, the wavelength of light received from them is greater than that of the light emitted. This is not due to the Doppler effect, as one might think, but to the expansion of space while the light from the galaxy is in transit. As light moves through expanding space, it too is drawn out. By the way, this does not conflict with the observation that distant galaxies have more blue stars in them. That's shown by the relative positions of the spectral lines. The redshifting displaces the spectral lines. It doesn't change their positions relative to each other or their strength. Anyway, if the speed of light toward us is infinite, space doesn't have time to expand while light is in transit. So why are distant galaxies always more redshift than nearby ones? How does Lyle explain cosmological redshift? Why do distant galaxies appear redshifted? Unless it's an illusion leading us to the question of why God would do that when he won't deceive us with images of non-existent stars. The question is, is it consistent with his nature to do something like that? And I don't think it is. It has to be a Doppler shift caused by the galaxy's motion through space rather than the expansion of space. But then why are they moving away from us? Why would God create a universe full of galaxies that move away from us faster and faster the farther they are away from us? And I think God did that just out of uh, his creative diversity. A related problem is the particle horizon. This is currently located about 47 billion light years away from us and past that nothing can ever be observed. Points beyond that horizon have always, or at least since the beginning of cosmic inflation, been receding from us faster than C, so this marks the absolute boundary of the observable universe. This doesn't violate relativity, by the way, because nothing is moving through space faster than C. But if the speed of light toward the observer is infinite, this boundary can't exist. Light that is emitted from a galaxy beyond the boundary should still reach us immediately, so why can't we see it? I can only assume that Lyle's answer is that God didn't put things farther from Earth than 47 billion light years in any direction, thus making Earth the absolute center of the universe. I suppose if Earth is the only interesting place as far as he's concerned, putting it in the middle would make sense, but why the 47 billion light year limit? Why not go all out and make it infinite? Or why not restrict the size of the universe to what we can see with the naked eye that he supposedly designed? And I think God did that just out of um, his creative diversity. Oh, shut up! Lyle seems to be advocating a brand of geocentrism, not one that puts Earth in the center of the solar system, but one that nonetheless throws the Copernican principle, the assumption that there's nothing special about our place in the universe, out the window without any real justification. That's a huge problem, and it reveals just how little he cares about actually learning anything useful about the universe. Without the Copernican principle, no astronomical observation has any scientific value. We can't make any predictions or offer any explanations because everything can be dismissed with a simple but you don't know that the laws of nature are the same over there. Needless to say, the success of science is a pretty good indicator that this version of geocentrism is, as Coulard logic puts it, bollocks. And the distant starlight problem, therefore, is solved if the Bible's using that convention, too. And so that's really the only issue. Is the Bible using this alternate, this uh, anisotropic synchrony convention, or is it using Einstein convention, or is it using something else? It's using some convention, because it's talking about time. So there's some convention there. And there it is. There's your justification for all of this. You assume biblical inerrancy in order to resolve a problem that, if unsolved, disproves biblical inerrancy. Two problems. One, we already know that the Bible is not inerrant because it contains countless errors. And two, 
This argument is obviously circular. But if you take a look at Genesis 1, 14 and 15, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and, and years. And later we find this is the sun, the moon and the stars also, the greater light, the lesser light, the, st the stars also. He says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. It's that last little phrase, and it was so. What was so? Well, they, they gave light on the earth. You see, God created them to give light on the earth, and apparently they immediately did. Uh, there could be other answers to that, but this is one that works, and nobody's been able to refute it, so I think it's a pretty good model. Of course no one can refute it. By your own admission, there's nothing to refute. All Lyle really does is cloak a circular argument in scientific language and wave his PhD around. I have a much simpler solution to the distant starlight problem. The universe is old. This fits perfectly with everything we observe in nature. And as an astrophysicist, you know that, Lyle. I may not be able to falsify your um, unfalsifiable convention, but I'll still say it. You, sir, are lying.